Hello there. Thank you all for joining our October Craig Rehab U webinar series. My name is Tracy Jensen. I'm one of the Craig Hospital's provider relations team, and I'll be the moderator today. Um, as a little bit of housekeeping related to continuing education credits, we will have three poll questions that will be launched throughout the webinar. Please be sure to answer all the questions to receive credit. In all honesty, you really only have to answer two of the three. <laughs> and you must attend at least 50 minutes of the presentation to receive credit. Um, credit will go to those who have signed on with the email used to register for this presentation. If you're in a room with multiple people, each person will need to sign on individually to receive credit. There is also an affidavit form that I can send to a group of people if needed, um, and I can provide you information on that. And credit is being provided today from our partners at the CEU Institute. So you'll be receiving an email directly from them after the webinar ends, um, and it can take up to a week or so to get that from them. Providing our talk today is one of Craig Hospital's amazing pharmacists, um, Kathy Collins. Kathy's a senior clinical pharmacist at Craig, a national leader in research and treatment of patients with spinal cord and brain injuries. Dr. Collins earned her doctor of pharmacy degree from the University of Colorado and is a board certified pharma pharmacotherapy specialist. I knew I'd mess that up. She is a clinical instructor for University of Colorado and Regis University Schools of Pharmacy. Dr. Collins has been a pharmacist in the community and hospital setting for over 20 years and presently has an active inpatient and ambulatory clinical practice. She, is, she has extensively presented on the topic of medication use and safety, including the topic of cannabis. If you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to submit a question in the chat or message window and we will get to your questions at the end of the presentation if time permits. Um, without further ado, I will be handing things over to Kathy. Hey, good morning, and thanks so much for joining us today. Um, we're talking about um, medical marijuana today, which is not a new topic. Um, we've had here in Colorado, where I'm speaking from, we've had medical marijuana for over 20 years. So my um, experience is that most people I talk to have a pretty good knowledge of this topic. They usually have some experiences or maybe even some opinions about this topic. And my hunch is that you do too. What I've found is that our patients have these opinions and experiences um, and knowledge of this topic, but what's missing is the interplay with us as providers with our patients. Having those balanced risk versus benefit discussions on this topic of marijuana like we would do with other topics. So my overarching goal for us today is just to provide enough information to you um, to where you feel really comfortable initiating these conversations with the patients that you encounter. So let's start by kind of looking at the landscape of the world right now. Um, I always like to show this map of the United States, and it's just, it's looking pretty green, which to me makes us have to change the way we talk about subjects like marijuana, because this is not an illicit substance. This is very legal in most of the country. Um, there are five states um, that are voting on this topic this November, so I expect the very next time I give this presentation, it's even going to be more green. Um, we did a study here at Craig Hospital um, asking our patients after they discharged from us about their cannabis use, and I'll show you some results of this throughout our talk today, um, but I wanted to just show you that Really, after our patients discharged from the hospital, after their injury, we found that almost 50% um, you tried marijuana afterwards, um, which is kind of about what people in Colorado do. About 50% of people have tried marijuana. Um, if you live in a state where maybe that's not quite as high as us, that's okay. But also know that even in our states where marijuana is not legal, they run about a 15, 14 to 15% marijuana use rate. So it makes me compelled to have conversations with patients, knowing that they're going to try this drug and I want them to be as safe as possible. So I propose that we all get really comfortable 
talking to our patients about marijuana. And the first step is just to ask the question about how they use marijuana. How many times have you used marijuana in the last month? And I've kind of proposed that we use those closed ended kind of questions that we're taught to do with alcohol and tobacco um, when we talk to our patients. And just really, I believe every patient should be queried um, regarding their potential for marijuana use. Um, before we get too far, we have to set a little bit of um, some, some guidelines for our discussion today. Um, our discussion today is medicinal marijuana, not recreational marijuana. Um, and so we have to kind of define what those two are. Um, I'm going to give you my definition, which you can take or leave, but the way I like to think of this when I talk to patients is really about what is their intent for use. Are they intending to use marijuana for a medicinal purpose? If that's the case, then I can have a conversation with them about risk versus benefit and weighing those two things out um, based on them as individuals. If they're using it recreationally, and I will define recreational use for us, at least for this, this talk today, I'd like to define recreational use as the intent to become impaired. Um, or alter their level of consciousness would be another way to say that. Um, let me give you an example. If I go home tonight after this presentation and I have a glass of wine to unwind and relax, um, is that medicinal? Is that recreational? You know, it's pretty muddy, to be honest with you. If, some, if I um, am looking for some heart benefit from my red wine, okay, well, we can have that kind of risk versus benefit conversation. However, if I go home tonight and I have three bottles of wine, that is clearly a line as a medical professional where I really can't be talking about benefit. I can only be talking about risk versus risk. Um, it's only a matter of when, not if, an adverse event is going to occur if I am using a substance to alter my consciousness. And so I want us to be really clear as we talk to patients um, about what their intent is and make sure that if we're engaging our patients, we're engaging them for medical use, not recreational use. Um, and I think it's real important to know that there's a huge overlap here. Um, I have lots of patients who use med medical marijuana um, at a lower dose during the week to help them with a condition such as pain or sleep or anxiety. But then maybe on the weekends, they'll use a higher dose, for example, um, to become more impaired. Um, and so it's really muddy, um, but it's worth the effort to try to get our patients to differentiate those two. Um, for this presentation, our focus is on medical marijuana. But our goal, whenever we talk to a patient, is really assess where they are on kind of a spectrum of safety and try to get them to a safer spot. Um, and that could be based on getting them to use a safer route, using them to use a lower dose, um, change their frequencies. Um, those kind of things are the discussions we want to have. But I'd like you, is our overarching kind of goal for talking to patients, try to keep that in mind that really we're looking at a harm reduction approach as we talk to our patients. All right, with that, we're going to dive in a little bit. I have um, three kind of main objectives I'd like us to talk about today. The first one is really, we're just gonna talk a little bit about Marijuana 101, um, kind of some basic things about marijuana and how that impacts our patients. Um, then I'm gonna switch and we're gonna do some rapid fire studies, kind of showing you what we have for evidence for efficacy for this chemical. And then lastly is where I live in my practice, which is really talking to patients about their individual risks and how to minimize that. All right, let's dive in. Um, I'd like to make sure you have a good understanding of what's going on in this cannabis sativa plant. Um, and before we start, let's stop and take a polling question and see how you guys are all feeling today about this. What do you guys think as far as how many different strains of marijuana are there out there? Um, a, a few, B, hundreds, C, thousands, and D is I don't know. As a pharmacist, I always tell my patient, my students um, that, you know, we don't want to guess. If you don't know, you just say, I don't know. So this is an absolutely appropriate answer, too. So let me know what you guys think. 
we have about 85% that have come in. It's kind of a neck and neck race on this. We have about 30% hundreds, 40% thousands, and 30 not sure. All right. So, so um, I'll, give it, I'll give it like maybe another five seconds to close the poll. Looks like thousands is winning out, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> so I put the reference that I used on on the slide here, which is leafly.com. Now I'm gonna encourage all of you to not look at this website on your employer's um, network. Um, make sure you do this at home because in my employer, this is actually a blocked website. Um, there are about three different species of marijuana. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Scientists say that there are about 700 strains of marijuana. However, if you go on leafly.com today, there are 3,500 plus um, different hybrids of all of those strains. So I think the answer is I don't know. Um, it seems like they're making lots and lots of different hybrids all the time. Um, but let's dive in a little bit more and talk about how those might impact a patient. So the main thing for you guys to take home about this cannabis sativa plant is just what a complicated organism it is. Um, it has over 100, last number I heard was 113 different cannabinoids. So a cannabinoid is a chemical that has activity in the cannabinoid system in our body. The cannabinoid system is just a system of receptor sites that are responsible for upregulation and downregulation of neurotransmitters, um, similar to many other sites within our body, upregulating things like norepinephrine and adenosine, um, things that we are used to having pharmaceutical targets um, to manipulate. We talk a lot about the two cannabinoids, THC, 9 delta height delta delta tetrahydrodiol, um, I said that wrong, excuse me, um, and then cannabidiol, CBD. So THC and CBD are the two we talk about a lot. That's because they're truly the two most abundant within the plant. It's also because they're the two we know the most about, most studied, but I don't want you guys to discount the activity of what we call minor cannabinoids, some of the other things going on in this plant. And there's a lot of really interesting research going on on these minor cannabinoids right now. And I think over the next 10 years, we're going to see use of these cannabinoids in things like blood pressure and diabetes, sleep. Um, so keep your ears open for that. Some other compounds that are found in this plant um, that are really high interest for study right now. Um, terpenes are basically things that give aroma and flavor to different cannabinoids um, and may alter a person's um, experience um, based on that. Other things like thiodes and steroids, flavonoids, these are all things that are found in all plants, but there's a lot of research on the cannabis plant right now with some of these. Um, for example, some of the flavonoids that they've been able to isolate are showing potential for anti-inflammatory properties. We're not able to harvest them in large enough quantities right now to be therapeutic, but I think that we're gonna see some really interesting things um, come out from that later. Let's talk a little bit about the two major cannabinoids today. Um, I'd like to focus on THC and CBD as we kind of go through. And starting with THC activity. So THC has binding potential at many sites throughout the body. However, its affinity or its binding strength to the CB1 receptor is so strong that we really can talk about its activity pretty exclusively at this receptor site. Now, CB1 receptors are found highly abundantly all throughout the brain and spinal cord, um, and they impact really all areas of the brain with the exception of the respiratory center at the brain stem, um, which is really important because that's why we don't have respiratory depression with cannabis like we do with opioids. 
Speaking of opioids, there are a lot of opioid receptors in the brain, but there's 10 times more CB1 receptors in the brain than new opioid receptors, which I think is really interesting if you think about how potent our opioid receptor system is in our bodies, and that our body has dedicated 10 times more of these CB1 receptors um, in our brain. And it's also super important to know that there are the CB1 receptors and our mu opioid receptors are really in close proximity to each other in the brain. And we believe there is some interplay between them, which may partially explain why THC has some pain relieving properties. We'll talk a little bit about those studies later. So let's contrast this with CBD. CBD has activity all throughout our body. In pharmacy school, this drug would be what we call a dirty drug meaning that pharmacists like drugs that work at one receptor site with a predictable outcome, kind of like THC um, really has. But CBD works all over the place and has many, many different activities in it. I listed some receptor sites here where I know that CBD has activity and there's a lot of actually study going on at these receptor sites. If you guys all put on your pharmacotherapist hats with me, kind of join along, what pharmacotherapists do is we know where a drug works, what receptor site, we know what the receptor site is responsible for, making some predictions then of what the possible outcome is. And so that's what we do with CBD when we start studying this. Let's start with CB1 receptors, that receptor where THC has such strong binding well, CBD actually has activity at that receptor too. What it does is it modulates the receptor binding of THC a little bit. So alters it just a little bit to where a little less THC binding occurs. This may partially explain why when CBD is given with THC, there seems to be a little less of the psychoactivity from THC. We also know that it can partially occlude that receptor site and keep other drugs from binding there exclusively. There's another receptor called CB2 receptors that's found within our periphery, but also on some of our immune cells, our beta cells or B cells. What we know here is that CB's, D, CB's D's binding at the CB2 receptor is that ultimately there's a reduced immune response. Now that's not a good thing if you're fighting an acute illness, but if you have a chronic autoimmune disease like arthritis, a decreased immune response that translates to in decreased inflammation may be a positive outcome. Other receptor sites on here, I'm just gonna breeze through real quick. The G protein coupled receptor site 55. This is where CBD has activity to prevent seizures, which is super important. And we'll talk about that again a little bit later. But also we know that this particular receptor site is involved in functions for vasodilation, lowering blood pressure, for example. Um, and again, anti-inflammatory effects. 5-HT1A, that is a type of serotonin receptor. People report that they have less anxiety with CBD and this may partially explain that. Again, this is an area, current area that's being studied. Other things, the TRPV, that's called a vanilloid receptor, which is involved in pain responses. Adenosine receptors are involved in muscle contraction and anti-inflammatory responses. Um, and then FA enzyme is a really fascinating enzyme in our body. It's the fatty acid amine hydrolase enzyme, which is responsible for transporting C THC into cells. This enzyme is blocked by CBD, which may mean a decrease of THC into our cells. Again, maybe partially explaining why we have that tempered psychoactive effects of THC when CBD is present. Really interesting, though, is this chemical, this FA enzyme, is responsible for breaking down some of our endocannabinoids, some of our own self-made, body-made cannabinoids that are available are broken down by this FA enzyme. CBD blocks that FA enzyme, and the end result is more of our own cannabinoids. When you read studies for the use of CBD, Across the board, people talk about using CBD for a sense of well-being. 
that may partially be explained by the rise in our own cannabinoids um, that our body makes. All right. Let's switch gears just a little bit and talk about some of the many, many different formulations of cannabis, because how our patients react to this drug depends on how they use this drug. In that study that we did here at Craig, where we asked former patients, found that most of our patients are using inhaled products, um, followed by some edibles and some topical products, really across the board. And well, the other thing we found in this study is that our patients are using more than one route at a time. So again, changes the way we have to talk to our patients about their risks when they use a product. So formulation, how a patient uses it, all make a difference. If you think about if a patient comes to me and tells me I'm using a product that is high THC content, I can start to make some assumptions about the effects that patient's going to have um, versus someone who comes to me and says I'm using just a CBD product. Again, knowing that THC is going to be more psychoactive and CBD less so, I can start to have some understanding of that patient's risk. So super important to ask them what they're using. I think it's also important for you to kind of have an idea in your head as you talk to patients about what a high dose is and what a low dose is. And we'll talk a little bit about this as we go through. But if someone comes to me and they're taking a 40% THC inhaled product, my assumptions are that they're going for a very fast onset. Inhaled products have a very fast onset. They're going for a high dose and impairment may be some, a possible side effect of that. If someone comes to me and they say they're using a five milligram edible product, I can say, well, that's a lower dose that they probably aren't going for a big impact on their impairment, on the impairment scale. We'll talk a little bit about high and low as we keep going. And then that plant species and strain, we talked about just how many different strains there are. Um, patients love to tell me about all the different strains they have. Um, and I think it's really fascinating botany, but it doesn't really make a difference as much in safety as it does maybe in patients' enjoyment of it. Um, and so as a medical professional, I'm really more focused on the safety that they use versus what strain they use. Let's take a side note um, and talk about hemp. Hemp is the same cannabis sativa plant as you will find in marijuana and dispensaries. But basically the definition of cannabis sativa has been divided into two categories by the federal government based on the threshold of THC found in that plant. So if a product has greater than 0.3% THC, we're gonna call it medical marijuana, and it's going to be, or, or, or recreational marijuana as well, but we're gonna call it mar marijuana, um, and it has to be sold in a dispensary in the states that are legal. If it has a lower concentration of THC, 0.3% or less, then that is gonna be defined as hemp. And it's gonna be available in many other avenues depending on the state's legal status. So what you need to know is the cannabis sativa plant, the stalks, the leaves of it are very fibrous. And so this is a plant that's been used for a long time to make textiles and ropes, things like that. And you'll see, see it used in clothing and all sorts of different things. The plant oils will be found in lotions and things like that. The seeds, a great source of fiber if you sprinkle those on your salad. But also, now that we've removed most of the THC in this chemical, in this compound, CBD is now the most abundant cannabinoid. And hemp is a very good source for CBD that avoids a lot of the regulatory um, loop, you know, jumping through hoops that has to be done if it was classified as marijuana. I'll tell you that the legal definition, the legal requirement to have um, hemp inspected to make sure that it does not meet, exceed the threshold of allowable THC, that is the only regulation 
right now on hemp products. There are no regulations for pesticides or purity or labeling or concentration. Um, so their product still carries with it a bit of a risk. I um, mean, it's really important to talk to people about their risks in choosing this product, especially if they're going to ingest CBD products. Some organizations voluntarily will do extra inspections, extra um, labeling and purity testing. So I always encourage people who are using a CBD product from a hemp source to look for some kind of seal of extra testing, such as USP or US Pharmacopedia um, designation or other kind of designations that are voluntary. All right, let's go back and talk about marijuana now. So products that are not um, necessarily at cultivation having less than 0. or having more than 0. 0.3 THC. Um, and there's just a lot out there, you guys. Um, I always say people are very, very imaginative on how they use THC mar marijuana products. Let's start with some of these inhaled products, um, starting kind of on the top left. We have joints, which is just a rolled um, cannabis product. Um, we call this in Colorado the poor man's marijuana because it is the least expensive way to purchase a marijuana product. People like inhaled marijuana because it has a very fast and very strong onset. So the onset is almost immediate and it tends to last about depending on a person's lung function, other biological factors, lasts about 45 minutes to two hours max, um, and then it's worn off. I try to steer people away from inhaled marijuana because it's just a lot of junk in their lungs. Here at Craig, I worry about people with spinal cord injury patients, that injuries that may involve cervical level where we know lung muscles being, might be involved. But we also need to think about those patients who have respiratory dysfunction, aspirin, as, asthma, COPD, things like that. I'll have patients tell me, well, don't worry about it. I vape. Um, so if, for those of you who don't know, vaping is really just heating the product at a lower temperature. So we don't have a lot of as much tar and ash, things like that um, being formed. Patients will tell me that the onset is not as strong with vaped products versus a inhaled um, the smoked marijuana. Um, my take on it again is always going to come from a safety standpoint. And I tell patients it's still junk in your lungs and we would like to have people be as safe as they can with that. I kind of crack up. If you look right next to the vape pen, um, a, medic, a meter dose inhaler. This is something that's available in Canada. I have not seen this in the United States. But it cracked me up, and it kind of made me think again about how people are very creative in looking at dosage forms. Um, the next dosage form we should talk about are edible products. I've got a cookie here. I've got some tablets here, tinctures, um, things like that. Um, what we know about edible products is depending on a patient's habitus, a patient's um, GI motility, what they have in their stomach, what other meds in their stomach, we know that edible products can be highly variable for patients. Um, on average, I would say an onset would be anywhere between a half an hour to two hours after ingesting a product. And that's really important for us to talk to patients about because most people are not patient, um, and so they will, you know, not feel the effects, and they will repeat their dose of it, um, and then they'll end up getting into trouble um, with over ingestion of these. Here in the state of Colorado, they've kind of arbitrarily said that 10 milligrams is an appropriate dose of an edible marijuana product. Um, I will tell you that for someone who is cannabis naive. That's pretty high dose, so I would definitely not ever recommend that someone start um, at that dose. And then I also think it's also important to know that doses of 20 to 30 milligrams and higher can start to cause some impairment and some tolerance as well. Again, everybody's a little bit different and they build up tolerance in different ways, um, but starting low is going to be super important to talk to our patients about that. Um, I got a couple examples of topical marijuana products on here um, that I want to just briefly touch on. Um, top of the products have a very unknown systemic absorption. Most of them, I would say generally, it's going to be a less absorption than things that are ingested. Um, however, there's some exceptions to that, say the transdermal patches. 
those are pharmaceutical grade transdermal patches. They're provided here in Colorado by Mylan Pharmaceuticals, the maker of prescription fentanyl patches. So these are very good vehicles for absorption. Um, and so they may or may not be quite as safe as we think they are. Um, there's a few other things, um, enemas, suppositories, tampons, sex lube, really there is um, no end to the different ways to use marijuana products. Um, but I want to just draw your attention to the bottom left-hand corner, which is intravenous marijuana. Um, and um, this is growing in prevalence, um, we're seeing this, where people are looking for ways for stronger, more potent highs um, with their marijuana. So as we talk about marijuana from a medicinal standpoint, I think it's very good for people to keep in mind that for some patients, marijuana is still is a drug of abuse. Um, and we need to be having those conversations with our patients as well. All right, um, just as far as a little bit, again, marijuana basics, marijuana testing is a very gray area. Um, right now, I don't think we've done a great job of um, figuring out a way to appropriately test patients for impairment. We know that um, the only way to detect a recent exposure is through blood and saliva. There's a lot of companies who are producing um, some like roadside kind of products, but none that have been accepted, widely accepted yet. Um, at this point, impairment is hard for us to determine because everyone has a different tolerance level. So it's hard to determine a cutoff for that. I would argue that that is also the case with alcohol, and at some point we just made that choice and that decision. I think there's a bigger lobby for marijuana right now, and so it's a little harder for us to um, have that clearly defined. All right, we're going to go fast and furious in this next section, so I ask all of you to hold on tight. I'd like to show you different studies that are out there for use of marijuana, but as we talk about the studies, I'd like you guys to keep in the back of your mind that thousands of different types of hybrids of marijuana that are out there. Because as we talk about studies, the products out there are so highly variable, the different strains, the different hybrids, the different formulations, the different doses. It is impossible for us to generalize the results from any study to what your patient may be using. And so I think it's super important. Um, let's do another polling question. Let's see how we're doing. Um, I want to test, see what you basically what you guys know about um, what's FDA approved right now. Um, do you think FDA cannabis is FDA approved for the treatment of cancer-related pain syndrome, tuberous sclerosis complex? narrow angle glaucoma or again i don't know is always a valid answer what do you guys think we have about 70 percent in looks like cancer related is winning out ah. <laughs> i'll give keep that pull up about another Couple seconds. Yep, we're at cancer related pain syndrome, Kathy. As the All winner. right. You know what? That's wrong. The answer is D, <laughs> tuberous sclerosis complex. So let's talk yeah. about some of these different indications um, for cannabis. Um, and some other options that are being currently studied. Um, before we get too into it, let's talk about patient-specific um, goals um, first. Um, that study, again, that we did here at Craig Hospital, if you look at the reasons people use marijuana for after their very traumatic injuries where they had treatment here at Craig for, um, pain, spasticity are very high on there, sleep, stress, anxiety, and then recreational. Um, is really the most prevalent on there. So again, helping our patients separate out recreational um, and then and trying to focus on these um, medical indications. You can see from my graph that people use, there's a great overlap. People use them for more than one reason. When I talk to a patient about their use of marijuana, remember my first step was ask who's using it. My second step, ask what they're using. 
And my third step is really ask them, what is their goal um, for using marijuana? It helps guide my conversations. I'm not going to talk about anxiety if their goal is for spasticity. Um, so it helps certainly narrow down my conversation. But also it helps me understand if their goal is reasonable. If I have someone who's saying I'm using marijuana to help me walk again after a complete spinal cord injury, well, our conversation is going to look very, very different than someone who's saying I want to use it to help sleep, right? Um, I had a brain injury patient recently. When I asked him his goal, he said it was to forget that he had a brain injury. You know, that is hard. You know, that is a tough, tough one. Um, but getting people to think about cannabis and marijuana use from a medicinal standpoint is really our goal for here. And then if it's for medicinal use, we don't put anybody on any therapy, medicinal or thera physical therapy, occupational therapy, without assessing how it's working, right? Um, and so that's a real important point is talking to people about how are they going to assess this goal? If they're using it for sleep, I'm like, well, pull out your smartphone, pull out your Fitbit, let's measure your sleep. If it's for pain, then what are the activities of daily living that we are going to measure that are going to help us understand if your pain is better? Um, and then honestly, if it's not meeting that goal, we shouldn't keep doing it. Um, and then lastly, I really want to talk about what are the other things we're missing? If people are using this as a medicinal target, what else are we missing? Um, an example, I had a younger kid who was have, with a spinal cord injury. He was having significant neuropathic pain shooting down his back through his hips and legs. Um, I was consulted to talk to him about this issue. But by the time I saw him later in the week, he'd been to seating clinic um, and wheelchair clinic at our hospital got some better positioning, some better um, cushions, and his pain was greatly resolved. That is ultimately always going to be our goal when we talk to our patients about cannabis use. Um, but let's dive into a little bit other things. Um, let's start with talking about those FDA-approved cannabis products. Um, so I think it's important to know that we have three products, two THC products, one CBD products that are approved right now by the FDA. Um, Marinol or Dronabinol and Sesame or Nabilone are synthetic THC products. So important to note, single molecule um, products that are approved. Um, these two products are approved for nausea and vomiting that's associated with chemotherapy, as well as um, weight loss associated with HIV infections. Now I'll tell you that we don't use them too much really for those indications. Um, and the reason is we have head-to-head -head trials for weight loss that show these THC products to be inferior. And we have head-to-head -head trials with some of our nausea and vomiting medications also showing the THC products to be inferior. Um, there's still a role for these products. Sometimes if the other medications that are available have been ruled out due to patient-specific factors or drug interactions, there may be a role for these. Um, we do tend to use them acutely in the hospitals for um, marijuana withdrawal syndromes. Um, but other than that, really, they're not mainstream therapy too much. Our CBD product, it goes by the brand name of Epidiolex, and this is where it is approved for tuberous sclerosis complex, which is a very rare childhood treatment-resistant seizure disorder. Um, that and Dravet syndrome and Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. Um, you will see these products used for these three um, seizure disorders. The things you need to know about it um, is that this is an adjunct treatment, um, the people, the patients who were in the Dravet and the Lennox Gestatz um, studies were on an average of three other seizure medications and tuberous sclerosis complex. They were on five other medications on average. Um, but there was a dose related response that was quite significant um, that was helpful to these children who just really had no other options. A few things I will tell you is at the end of the 18 month studies of looking at these seizure disorders, seizure frequency was increasing. Um, the FDA asked the manufacturer to extend their studies and they declined. And we see that in practice where it does seem to be a time limited response to that. Um, some other things you need to know is there's some significant drug interactions um, with this with CBD and other seizure medications um, that really cause liver toxicity. So serial liver monitoring is important, um, as well as monitoring for those drug interactions. All right, let's move on to the non 
FDA approved indications. So you all kind of were thinking about cancer pain um, and that makes sense because I feel like that is one of the um, most, um, most used um, reason, most the reason most people do use pain um, when we look at studies. Um, I wanted to show you kind of what I consider one of the better studies that was looking at pain. This was non-cancer pain, but this was a study that looked at thousands and thousands of patients with chronic pain syndromes. Um, and they looked back, um, it, this is a meta-analysis and systematic review where they just looked at lots and lots of studies and did some statistical analysis to determine. Um, they used a threshold of a 30% pain response, which is a very good threshold to use. That's the FDA um, approved for all pain studies. That's the threshold the FDA requires. And what they found is there was a decrease in pain. 29% um, of people who used cannabis had a reduction in pain versus about 26 of people percent of people who use placebo. So what I see here is there's something there. However, the effect size is only about 3%, um, so pretty small. Um, when they looked at studies that had a numeric scale, um, they found that there was about a 3% reduction in pain overall. Um, number needed to treat was 24, number needed to harm was six, and their conclusion is that it really isn't all that likely that this would be response would be helpful for chronic pain. Now, I want to just give a little background information on this. A lot of the studies here are are tough studies. Pain studies are generally hard. How much are people getting pain relief versus maybe forgetting about their pain? We have to think about that. They're just subjective in general. Cannabis marijuana studies are hard to blind. People know what they're getting. Um, and in this meta-analysis, some studies that were included were very short, um, six hours, 14 days long. So chronic pain, again, is a tough one to study. Um, let's talk about um, some objective data, though, that I think is really good as we talk about cannabis use. Um, this was a study done of pain, cancer patients um, with pain before and after they started using a marijuana product. And here they measured opioid use and use of benzodiazepines like Valium, Xanax, things like that. What they found is there was about a 30% reduction in the use of opioids after patients started using cannabis. Now, objective data is pretty exciting in a pain study. So we're really jazzed about that. I will tell you that that reduction in pain has been seen in at least two other much smaller studies, like with just a dozen patients or so. Um, they saw about a 25% reduction in pain. Um, they did not see any reduction in benzodiazepine use. But still, a reduction in opioids is, is a big deal. Um, because we know what opioids can do to the body, um, that's, that's pretty interesting. People will ask me all the time, can cannabis be used as a substitute for opioids? And what I say is that's not what the studies show. The studies show a reduction in opioid use, not an elimination. Um, and so now I have patients who are on two medications, two drugs. Is that okay? Maybe. Um, if I have a patient who is on the road to a cannabis use or an opioid use disorder and this keeps them on a safer side, I might be okay with that. All right, I'm going to pick up the pace here, you guys. Hang on with me. We're going to talk about spasticity. Um, this is a product um, that is widely used called Sativex. It's widely used all throughout Europe, really everywhere but the United States. Um, it's used for MS patients with spasticity um, and it's being studied for pain right now. Um, what they looked here is they looked at objective and subjective data when they looked at Ashworth scale, which is a measurement of intensity and frequency of spasms. Um, they found a reduction, but it was not statistically significant. So we really can't use that. That confidence interval crosses zero, meaning maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Um, but when they looked at um, objective or subjective data, how do you feel, um, there was a statistically significant reduction of about 0.76%. Um, so that's really interesting. Um, this product has been in phase three trials here in the United States for over 10 years. They have a hard time finding investors for it because cannabis is so widely available without a prescription in the United States. There really isn't much market for this drug. All right, let's talk about sleep. 
Um, this is a meta-analysis, again, a systematic review looking at a lot of studies. What we know is that sleep subjectively is improved with cannabis. Objectively, studies are mixed. Some say it helps, some say it doesn't. We do know that tolerance develops over time. And so helping people understand that maybe not using it daily might help their sleep in the long run. Um, withdrawal is a significant um, concern for patients with cannabis use, especially with regular use. Um, they can have sleep disturbances for up to six weeks after they stop using cannabis. PTSD is another hot topic for cannabis use. And it's a very frustrating one because we just don't have good data. What we know is patients who have PTSD use cannabis, use more cannabis, and those who use more cannabis have more PTSD symptoms. So we just have this chicken and egg without really good data. Um, I'm hopeful that this is an area of study where we can get some more benefit in the future. Brain injury is another hot topic right now. You'll see lots and lots of concussion studies coming out. Um, what we're finding is that people are reporting symptomatic relief from concussion symptoms, which are some of the things we've talked about, like sleep disorders after, after a concussion, um, after brain injury, they, you know, they have things like anxiety and agitation. So that makes sense to me that there might be some benefit. What we're not seeing is a um, improvement in recovery time with one of our, the first studies showing um, no change in recovery time and this other the st second study listed actually showing longer recovery times with cannabis. Um, so I think more studies are needed in this area for sure. All right, you guys are hanging on tight with me. I'm talking a little bit faster, so I appreciate your patience with me. Um, we need to talk about safety. I really think that as medical professionals, this is where we need to live. This is where we need to be focusing our efforts with patients. Um, so let's do another polling question. Let's see where you guys think. Medical use of cannabis has an adverse event rate of A, 50%, B, 72%, um, supposed to be C, sorry, my letters are off, the third choice C, 86%, and D is always can be, I don't know. What do you guys think? We look, it looks like right now we've got about 50%, the A. a right. And then um, also a lot of not sures. Yeah. So I think I fall in the not sure as well um, because I think everybody is so individualized. I will show you one study. Um, that looked at a big, again, systematic review and meta-analysis where they looked at about 5,000 different adverse events and they showed 86%. So a risk, risk um, rate of 1.86, so about 86% increase in their risk of having an adverse event. Um, this is just one study. I think every study I see has a different rate. Um, but I think what's important to note is while you have a much greater risk of having an adverse event, that in this study, they showed patients who used marijuana for a medicinal use used lower doses, and the adverse events that did occur were mostly very mild. So dizziness, drowsiness, UTI, things like that. Um, and so I think that's really important for us to keep in mind as we talk to patients about our medicinal versus recreational use and about dosing and keeping their doses lower that if they do have an adverse event, they will be in a much safer place if they use those lower doses. Um, this chart, you know, just kind of summarizes a lot of the adverse events that we know are possible with cannabis use. Um, in the short term with impairment, we know dizziness, euphoria, anxiety, hallucinations, um, psychosis, all of those kind of things are possible. Long term addiction, dependence, withdrawal. I mean, there's some interesting studies showing less academic and career success. We know adverse effects happen. Um, what we want to focus on is how are we going to talk to our patients? to make sure that they're being as safe as possible. So I would never share this type of information with a patient. What I wanna do is ask my patient what their specific individual risk is. Um, again, that study we did here at Cray, you can kind of see what the main um, adverse events that they reported are, which 
eight included like motivation, feeling a little hazy, tiredness, things like that. So milder things in nature, um, possibly having some long-term impact. Again, I ask the patient what their perceived negatives are because I want to know what's specific to them. Is it falls? Is it um, concerns? I had one patient who was concerned for driving his kids to school. Um, then I can have some really specific conversations with our patients on that. Um, I want to know are these what are the negatives to balance out with their positives? What are the risks associated with their individual this patient that I can then help them balance out with those goals that they had as individuals as well? So when I like to talk to a patient, I like to focus on who are the patients that are higher risk, noting that most of our patients who use marijuana are going to have very minor effects. Where are the patients I need to focus on? Who are the patients with risk factors and comorbid conditions? And I'm a pharmacist, so of course I'm going to talk about drug interactions with them. And I really want to focus on those. So let's go through some of these type of patient populations where the biggest bang for your buck is going to be in focusing on your patients. We talked a little bit about respiratory patients, trying to identify those patients with respiratory disease, or in my case, spinal cord injuries that might involve lung muscles. Um, what we know is that inhaled cannabis has a higher rate of things like bronchitis and sputum production and infections, similar to tobacco. Also similar to tobacco, when you stop inhaling marijuana, those things can actually get a lot better. So really important counseling point for our patients. We need to talk about our patients with cardiovascular disease, those with prior um, history of CV or strong family histories. We know that THC is a cardiac stimulant. Um, when you first say with an inhaled cannabis product, we know there's a very strong, very immediate impact on a patient. We know that blood pressure and heart rate go up dramatically during those first few minutes. Now, ultimately, I believe that there's a decreased heart rate and a decreased blood pressure. But those first few minutes of a high from an inhaled product, you actually have one study showed a four times greater risk of having an MI during those first few minutes. So talking to our patients about using a product that maybe doesn't have a strong or fast end onset, like an oral product, um, might be better for them if they have a cardiovascular disease. And that doses and duration um, and cardiac history will make a difference. And then, of course, medications that increase heart rate, like sympathomimetics, our stimulants, or anticholinergics, um, can also exasperate um, that um, increased heart rate and their risk. Mental health, I think, is another big population we have to focus on. Our patients with um, mental health diseases, we know that memory and cognition can be affected by cannabis, but also we know that there's an association with cannabis and anxiety and depression. Um, this first study by Patton in 2002 was in teenagers, and it was a great study in that they isolated out um, the com any confounders that could be contributing, like family dynamics and socioeconomic status, um, academic success, and they found cannabis to be an independent factor. We also know dependence can occur with cannabis. If patients are using it now and then, the actual the dependence low, it, level is pretty low, but as they become more frequent users, daily users in this particular study, the dependence rate gets up towards where nicotine is at 50%. Um, we also need to think about the link with cannabis and psychosis. Um, we know there was a study done by Marconi in 2016 where he did again a meta-analysis and what he did is he stratified cannabis use into kind of the low, medium, high. He didn't tell us what those values actually meant, but kind of just made these categories. In the people who were the heavier users of cannabis, every single study showed an association with psychosis. And there's also an interesting dynamic between marijuana use and schizophrenia. Um, there doesn't appear to be more cases of schizophrenia as cannabis increases. However, if someone is predisposed to schizophrenia, so has a strong family history or may have developed that regardless, we know that the onset is stronger and the symptoms are worse in patients who also use cannabis. So again, a patient population we really need to be focused on. 
I think in our brain injury patient, we really need to talk about patients' risk for stroke. Um, an interesting study showing nearly 2.5 times likely to, can't, to have a stroke if you're a cannabis user versus a non-cannabis user. And this was interesting because this was not the daily users, what we would consider more heavy users. This was 10 days per month. Um, really important to know that younger adults, those people who are in um, the age group of 18 to 35, showed, again, almost a two times higher rate of having a stroke. And then really interesting, they also showed an association with marijuana users, those younger patients, 35 and younger, on having secondary strokes. So something we really need to be talking to our patients right now, um, our stroke patients, about their risk moving forward. Pregnancy is another really sensitive area that I think we need to focus our, our attention on. We know that cannabis use has gone up in all patient populations, and our pregnant women, it's no different from that. Um, we did this really interesting study here in Colorado where they called dispensary, said, I'm pregnant, I'm having morning sickness, what should I do? And almost 70% of people recommended marijuana use to these pregnant patients, um, with only about a third of them also saying, talk to your doctor. So we have this perception of it being safe for our pregnant women. Um, but let's talk about what we do know. Um, here in Colorado, when marijuana was legalized for recreational use, they also made a requirement for surveillance of adverse events. And what they found is by testing pregnant women, they found that Patients, babies born to our pregnant women um, have a greater risk of being born with a lower birth weight. Um, they also found that they had a greater risk of being admitted to a NICU, um, as well as complications to the mom who was using marijuana, um, greater risk of preeclampsia and high blood pressures um, as well. There, we know that marijuana readily crosses the placenta and enters the fetal brain. We also know that it readily crosses breast milk as well. Um, and because it's a really lipophilic compound, it's stored up in the fatty tissues of the body and leached out in breast milk over up to six weeks. So it's important to talk to our patients about who are pregnant, but also breastfeeding, pumping and dumping does not work with marijuana use. Um, last one we're going to talk about, and I'm running out of time, guys, so I apologize. Um, we got to talk about kids. You know, kids just have such a perception um, that they are just invincible um, and that marijuana is safe. If you look at these charts, I think it's important to know that overall, marijuana use amongst teenagers really has not increased that much with legalization. However, if you look at the yellow bands, those are our younger kids, our 10th graders. Marijuana use has increased in that population. Um, this is an interesting study I wanted to just show you that was done in um, Australia, actually, where they interviewed teenagers about their marijuana use, and they put them into categories about how often they use marijuana, monthly, more than monthly, weekly, daily. And then they measured them again at age 35 to see if cannabis use at a younger age made an impact at a later age. And they found that those kids who used marijuana on a daily basis, so much more frequency as teenagers, had a higher rate of not completing high school, not getting a degree. They had higher rates of cannabis dependence, other illicit drug use, and greater risk of suicide attempts. Now, I think we have a little bit of a chicken and egg situation here as far as cannabis use, um, which came first? Um, you know, it's just really the most accessible compound. So is that really a factor? And I think that's still to be teased out um, from studies, but I think what we can tell people, tell our teenagers, is that their risk goes up with more frequent use. Um, and so by using marijuana on such a high, their risk increases with the more use. So if we can get them to pull back, I think we can decrease their risk. Um, my last slide, I'm just going to, or last point I want to make is about drug interactions. You guys need to know that there are a lot of drug interactions. Um, and you just need to call me, call your pharmacist um, and ask about this. We have great resources. We'll be able to explain to it a few flags, anything that is um, antibiotics, 
um, our seizure medications, and anything that is also a CNS depressant, we need to think about additive effects with marijuana. So if you can remember those three things, you guys are doing great. If you ever have any questions, call your pharmacist. We'd be happy to look up any of those items. Oh, all right, we did good. There's a lot of information. I appreciate you guys hanging out with me. Um, the bottom line is I really want you guys all feel comfortable talking to your patients about it. And the only way to do that is ask who's using it, ask what they're using it, and then try to figure out their goals, try to figure out their individual risk rate, and just have those balanced conversations with them. Really appreciate your time. I didn't leave quest time for questions. I apologize for that. Um, but I want to let you know that you can email me um, any questions you might have, and I would be happy to get back to you um, and provide any information that I can find for you. Thanks, Kathy. I do have a couple questions that were in the queue, so I'll send those to you um, for you to take a look at, and then I can provide those answers to folks, too. Thanks again, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much. And just as a reminder, um, you will be receiving a separate email from CEU Institute regarding any continuing education credits you may need. Um, they can take anywhere from a week to three weeks. It depends on um, what they need to do to process it. So just be patient with that. Um, and they can sometimes go into the junk folders too. So be sure to check there. And then we will also send you um, a separate email from Craig Hospital. Um, which has a separate survey, but we really would like to get any feedback that you have about the webinar um, and also any uh, future interest topics that may come up. And uh, we really appreciate it. You'll also, we'll have, we did record this, so that will be provided on the uh, email follow-up from us as well. And if any questions come up, feel free to reach out um, to myself. It's T. Jensen. J-E-N-S-E-N -E at craighospital.org. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing you next year, 2023, for our next webinar. Thanks so much.